it, we'd never see it. But here it is. The return to glory. Just to come back here and then to play as well as I did and to do it here. This has meant so much to me and my family, this tournament. Pinder against Ruiz. Pinder against Ruiz. Pinder, Pinder, Pinder! Shane Lowry is an open champion at Royal Portrush. I mean, I, I was going in for shoulder on Kyle Barrett, and he sidestepped inside, and my men, momentum kind of took me through. Um, in my opinion, there's no, there's absolutely no way of defending off. Full-time score here at the end of it all. It's Dublin, one goal and 18 points. Kerry, 15 points. <laughs> Three scores go for the winner by unanimous decision. The fighting pride of Ireland. Now, a two-time world champion and new WBO Women's Super Lightweight Champion of the World, Katie of glee on the faces of these Cherry Blossoms players. Four years ago in Brighton, they beat the Springboks. And four years on, they have humbled Ireland, who very recently were the number one side in world rugby. We probably would have been better off just to stay with our week-to-week -week focus, to, to, to live in the moment and, and play the tournament we were in. And if I had my time over, I'd, I'd, I'd probably change that. Okay, so we're having a little get-together. We are just seven days out from Christmas, so we're taking stock of the year that was. I should say at the outset, we are going to make a mess of this. We are going to forget to mention half a dozen things at least. We're not entirely sure if this is an international look back in the year that was or just an Irish one. We're not sure if we're picking out our moments of the year. We're not exactly sure what we're doing, but we decided we would just chat about the sporting year that was in no particular way for the guts of an hour. So on that premise, and you'll have to forgive us all really for making here, a mess of this, <laughs> a mess of this, and forgetting lots of things we should talk about, which we will do. If you're accepting those terms, then stay with us. We have Roland Mullen, who we've dragged from the off-the-ball crack research team into studio. Hello. Happy to be here, Joe. We have Rory O'Connor because we thought the misery of 2019 in Japan should be covered in great detail. Hello. Absolutely. Hi, Joe. Irish Independent. And Johnny Ward, of course, is here for the evening. And you've been talking FAI in the first hour. And we will talk FAI in the next hour. So we don't need to talk FAI. It is hour. the undoubted highlight of the year. <laughs> it's certainly the most memorable <laughs> moment. Give me your, I don't want to say highlight, give me your most memorable sporting moment of the year, excluding Johnny FAI, because I think John Delaney's appearance at the Oireachtas will live long in the memory. Ronan Mullen, you're up first. Well, I'm going to say Katie Taylor, but I live in that bubble, so I don't know if people necessarily agree. Mm -hmm. But just like having covered that sport basically daily and to see what she was achieving like in, in person when I was in Madison Square Garden on that grandest of stages to win an undisputed title, which is such a rarity in the history of the sport, not just women's boxing or anything like that. Yeah. So for me, like that stands out. Like in The rugby itself, even though not a highlight, memorable, I think the journey from the Six Nations, that England game, where... Robbie Henshaw was given his head at full back from that point to the end of the year. That's probably the most significant. Compelling. Uh, like the FAI, obviously, yeah. notwithstanding. Yeah. The, the, um, from a sporting point of view on the field, I think that progression or regression has been the most noteworthy thing that's happened. Taylor's achievement is still up for debate. I was on the hard shoulder today. Up for debate among who? <laughs> Ivan Yates. <laughs> yeah, it's a very uh, exclusive field. Well, he people. argued she, did, she, she didn't deserve the first fight. Against Pursun. Yeah. Well, that was a very competitive fight. It's just because all of our other fights have been such a, like, more or less procession. He also argued you didn't deserve the most recent one, too. No, well, that's nonsense. I tried it down on that. Uh, yeah, well, like, just because um, the other fighters landing punches doesn't mean she's winning rounds. You know, that's kind of the object of the game is mm -hmm. to try and hit each other. So mm -hmm. just, like, if there's success, how do you define success in a fight? Obviously, that's very subjective. But she clearly won the most recent one, and... The first one against Pursun was a draw, would have been fair in my opinion, but it had to go either way. I prefer to see a conclusive winner, yeah. and they had to give it to somebody. It won that, um, that poll that comes out every year of the, the most kind of impactful moments in sport or whatever it is, which I, I was surprised by because it's behind a paywall. Certainly my WhatsApp groups didn't light up when it was happening. I don't know if, um, if I'm just in a kind of my own little eco chamber of sport. Oh, I'm, but the same. I'm the same, it didn't light up in my world. 
All right, that's, yeah. I'll just leave. It's fine. No, I didn't. No, that's no. the truth. It's interesting because the, well, the, the general public. No, 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 yeah, no. Yeah, well, I, 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 I did, su- did the general that. public watch it? I wonder, or did they well, just know the achievement? Yeah. yeah, I don't know. No, no, I'll, Ronan. I'll admit that it, it didn't probably transcend the barriers as London <coughs> 2012 did, for example, when that was on terrestrial television, everyone got to see it. Yeah. And to that point, no one had probably seen her fight even. So yeah. that was a very exclusive window where her fights were being televised. Everyone knew when they were on. It was like communal viewing almost. Whereas these fights are happening often in the middle of the night. Yeah. And I've been lucky enough to, to be there. And like when you're enraptured and all this kind of, like when she's over there, she's a star. Like the Anthony Joshua brigade aside, who he's he's selling the fight, but she's the next big draw. Mm. She's the, she's the one that they put out front and center. The zone we've spoken about before, Joe, billion dollar industry in boxing in America, and she's one of their flagship stars. So it's not as if just because she's not making waves over here, she's making serious waves internationally, and she has done for the last fifteen years. So it was interesting that in that Tenio sponsorship poll today, which was of a thousand different people right across the country, they didn't go for sports fans. They just went for a thousand people. It was gender uh, neutral. It was like different parts of the country, different class. It tried to get as big a kind of spectrum as people as possible. And she was named as the most admired sports person. Shane Larry was second. Johnny Sexton, Sexton was third, third which yeah. was interesting. I think he was and, first uh, last year, wasn't he? Yeah. I think Katie's pretty much been up there pretty, you know, since pre-2012 when yeah. no one had seen her, apart from coming back on the RT News. Fourth was like, uh, oh, the Donovan brothers. Peter O'Mahony was there. Rory Best was there. I was kind of surprised to see that. Yeah. And then I can't remember who. But it was interesting that if you take like O'Mahony, Sexton, Larry to a lesser degree, Taylor, that's a real substance over style vote. Like they are not big, shiny, media, convenient personalities. Anytime Johnny Sexton's on the late, late show, people give out about how boring and gruff he is. Peter O'Mahony's gruff. Taylor is not a big like media performer. Shane Larry, probably a bit more so, but still very, very ordinary and not in any way manufactured. It's very interesting that even the non-sporting public can see the substance over the style. Yeah, and I wonder if you went out, like you, you guys have obviously have a very engaged re- readership or listenership and followership, you know, our Twitter followers would all be very engaged in the sports that we f- follow. Mm. If you were to go to them and ask them the same question, you know, I'd be interested to know if it ha- if, if they get the same response, whereas yeah. your casual punter who might not even be, if it's only a thousand random, it's basically the Late Late Show audience, isn't it? And yeah. that's, um, yeah. you know, they like Katie Taylor. And if they're given a list, I don't know how the survey was conducted, I, I imagine they were given a list of, 10 sporting events and they're like well that was you yeah, know that's lovely to see and they saw it in the news or whatever so yeah. um yeah it'd be interesting i see kieran shannon's just written a piece arguing that actually the irish sports person of the decade is roy mcelroy and it's hard to argue with that really four majors for a country this size is unbelievable an island this size that's the point is there an issue with geography there but he doesn't even feature on most admired sports person he's probably not all that well or not as well liked maybe as, as some other golfers um, but in terms of achievement absolutely and Probably gets a slightly unfair or bad press as well. He's, I mean, Rory's been, Rory was a prodigy. He was, you know, you can imagine what his life has been like since he was a kid. He was destined for a kind of greatness and, uh, you know, us kind of normal people, we, we can't really relate to that. And um, Rory's, Rory's achievements are staggering. I, I guess, like, I'm not obviously, um, to paraphrase the dude in the Big Lebowski, I'm not a golfer, but um, I would like I would say Rory would just have a bit of an issue with his his last day achievements in golf the last while because he's seemed to have kind of lost some tournaments he should have won. Mm. He just he's not that popular, is he? I mean, no. you know, he's obviously his achievements are matched, but people the the he's a kind of a posh you know, accent, but he's from like he's from a posh part of Northern Ireland. From, yeah, I think there is a, just a, a crossover uh, but appeal his, there. His well, dad like, had to work like two jobs. He was not from a posh family. Yeah. I, I can't explain it. I mean, I think the Olympics thing probably doesn't damage. Mm. You know, the the Trump thing doesn't help. There's, you know, the fact that he declared and then the Zika thing. Like, the, you know, he's been wishy washy on a number of topics. He flip flops quite a bit, and people do buy into that um, and do probably put a lot of store in it. Mm. But you know, and also like people don't like winners that much. You know, people like Shane Lowry because like he he's, he has obviously won on big big moments, but he's also struggled and there's a bit of an everyman to him. Where yeah. you know, seeing a guy who's like he didn't have a silver spoon. That's that's quite clear. But he was on the Jerry Kelly show doing keep up. He's with his golf club at what seven or eight. You know, that's not like there are there is a, there is a section of society who love Tiger Woods, but there's a whole lot of other people who want an underdog to win. And I think in your general public, in yeah. your in your kind of general public survey, I think if you ask golf fans, they probably like him quite a lot. If yeah. you ask your general public man on the street, he doesn't well, transcend. That's the dichotomy between the U.S. and here. The U.S. US Americans love a Tiger Woods story. In Ireland, it's just, it's the old story about like 
hey, look at that guy with the big house in America. They're like, yeah, I want to be that guy. And in Ireland, they're like, who does he think he is? <laughs> and we, that's why my, my vote would go to uh, Lowry, even though I have, I, I'm not a golfer. I don't, I, I, pro I don't even know if I watched the Open, but in fairness, it was Lowry winning the Open in Northern Ireland. Mm. And what I remember most about it is the interview with his grandmother, because his grandmother, I can relate to that person over and over again, talking about getting him to bring in the turf, that was me and East Galway as a kid, talking about like um, her upbringing when they did nothing but they were very happy and just the delight that it gave her and just the fact that Lowry, like I, I can't speak for someone I've never met, but I would be amazed if he isn't an absolute champ of a guy. <laughs> he goes to the boar's head afterwards and drinks his few pints, you know, he loves Offaly GEA. Mm, um, that's Ruby. So, yeah, yeah, so he's just like, and it was, it was also the fact that I think that in a predominantly unionist part of Northern Ireland, the, the fans up there, the local fans, really wanted Lowry to win. Mm. Um, at a time when the politics in this island have, are so complex and Northern Ireland's in such a strange place at the moment, um, yeah. I think that was a particularly special win. Where are you on McElroy, Ronan Mullen? I'm not sure, like, for someone who's grown up in the limelight, in, into probably the most media savvy generation of sports people we've ever seen, he doesn't half put his foot in his mouth every now and then. Like, is that not endearing if we're talking about somebody who's flawed? I don't know. Like as we as we always say, we like to hear sports people speak their minds, but it feels like we he's really got don't. several different minds. Like he comes out with different but perspectives. Then when, and when sports people are honest, we often shoot them down yeah. for it. And then like we don't like we'd rather a polished someone who says nothing like Katie Taylor. Like yeah. you know, thank God and good luck. You know, I mean, uh, yeah, Rory McIlroy's given some of the best interviews you'll ever see. Yeah, but his honesty probably, you know, he might he might be higher up on that list if he was mm. more corporate. Yeah. I mean, he's very corporate. I mean, he's lots of good sponsors. I'm not saying it's, it's kind of held, held him back in that regard. I'd say he's probably more popular in America, among American golf fans than he is among casual Irish fans. I would but think that's so. maybe overestimated. No, I would think he's, he's unbelievably achieved, popular. Whose achievement is better this year? McElroy's consistency over the 12 months or Lowry in that one off unbelievable success? You're the golf man. You win the Open, though. Unfortunately for Rory, yeah, you win the Open. He'd swap it all for a major. But Rory's consistency has been phenomenal. Like, yeah. Just phenomenal and it's just taken for granted. In fact, it's but that, almost listed as a bit of a failure for him. That's mm. a much better barometer for success to be consistently good over a year than to win a one-off tournament, oh, yeah. surely, in well, any other well, sport. But he's a better golfer than Shane Lowry. Even Shane Lowry would concede that point. Yeah. It's just Lowry caught fire for four days. I like McElroy very much, I have to say, even though he's a bit flawed, but he's the most interesting golfer in the world after Tiger. Yeah. He's wearing an hour up the road. An hour up the road, four majors. He is inarguably the sports person from this island of the decade. I thought Speed yeah. was the most interesting. He's also very interesting. <laughs> you find golfers very interesting though, Joe. It's a bit of an affliction for you. I really you know, don't. You, I really you can don't. hear your voice just changes when it's, when it's golf and it's the... Um, yeah, but he is, as I, uh, probably one of the most... Is he the most interesting Irish sportsman on the go? I think his contradictions make him one of them. I mean, I, I don't particularly watch four rounds of golf over a weekend, but if he's speaking, uh, not not a post-match interview, but if, if he's in here or he's, he's doing a sit-down with mm. Kim or something like that, I will always read it because he's always compelling and I might get annoyed about it, but he, you know, he's uniquely interesting. Tiger at the Masters obviously gets mentioned. It was just unbelievable. It was the most unforeseeable thing ever. And if we're sticking for golf, then I'll briefly just mention as well, Leona Maguire and Stephanie Meadow both getting their LBGA tour cards and that is uh, going to be great because that's all on Sky Sports now increasingly. Meadow hold a 20-footer to get herself on tour and she knew she needed to hold the 20 footer it was a phenomenal moment so that deserves a mention as well there'll be big names hopefully over the next year that was golf rory yeah your highlight slash most memorable moment of the year most memorable moment has to be she's walker um oh, there was a lot of them like i mean it's, which uh, one was she's walker she's walker was japan oh, no but which um, one which one japan? what happened japan. new zealand no, it was japan, japan. it was japan. the defeat to japan okay and being there watching the game change right in front of you with the crowd. I just never heard a noise. It's not, it wasn't even the loudest crowd that I've ever been part of, but it's just this unique sound that the Japanese fans made. It was this, it was like, it was like the engine of a motor and it kept getting louder and louder and louder and more, and they, they cheered everything. And you just, I couldn't help but get just like excited by it because it was a proper piece of sporting history. Part of you towards the end want Japan to win. I must oh. admit, part of me towards the end wanted Japan to win because I figured Ireland were getting through anyway. I don't know. I don't really think look at it that way when it comes to the games uncovering. I, I mean, it's a better story. It, it made it made the World Cup more interesting, but you know, my chances of being there covering Ireland for longer probably took a hit that day. So um, <laughs> that that was the day you knew it was over. No, no, the day I knew it was over was Russia. I thought they were absolutely. I thought they could bounce back. 
Oh, we kind of knew it was over in Twickenham, didn't we? Like we. No, I didn't think it was over in Twickenham. I, did, I didn't yeah. put any store in those oh, matches. They were so bad that day. I know, but I mean, it's just like a, this, it's, it's a, a succession of disasters. It's a I mean, game. Like you could say you knew it was over in the first Six Nations match, the first minute of the first Six <laughs> no, Nations. We match. didn't know that. Then Wales. Every time they kind of got you back, but the, after Japan, they never gave you. Even though the small game was good and people started convincing themselves, and we all they they no like. Russia was the one you were just watching them Which play. Which was the game brains. after the Japan game. They won. They, they nilled Russia and won yeah. 34 nil or something. But um, that was the game after Japan, wasn't after it? After Japan, yeah. five days after Japan, in, in that um, oven, yeah. the, the Kobe Masaki Stadium. It, it was uh, after it was the Six Nations. Though you knew that you know that this 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 show isn't isn't what we thought it was. Yeah, but you kind of kept convincing yourself that it'd be all right because the coach was so good and the players were so good and they had such a good year and they maybe they, they tailored their training to be right. And then they come out against Scotland and they're really good. And the first 20 minutes against Japan, they were brilliant. They had them on the rack. They'd scored two tries. They were, they were, yeah. I think they relaxed themselves thinking they'd done it. It's, it's, in, it's, um, a, it's interesting you say about the, the crowd in the Japan game because if you're, at a, if you're at an event and it could be even like a, a political rally where the crowd just starts getting like this fever of something that's completely intangible and a crowd can change the result of a game. And um, Kevin Poulain, who's a Racing Post football expert, he's, I remember one of the things, he, he, everything with him is about logic and he said... Home teams have an advantage over away teams. We've never actually understood why that is. Yeah. Right, that's what he said. Now, I think there probably are reasons. I think some of it is psychological in that because we're at home, we have a better chance. And whether or not that is true, it's already built into your head and it gives you a little bit more confidence. Yeah. But on a day like that in Japan, if the Japanese players who are obviously, this is kind of a, a new phenomenon, they're in the World Cup, if they couldn't buy into that wave of emotion as a player, can you imagine being out in that pitch mm. and, and making a hard tackle and, and whatever it was, 60,000 people are going... Referees, referees are massively influenced by it as well. Like yeah. The NBA did a study and that was the biggest finding they had, that the referees were the most influenced yeah. as opposed to the players' performance. If you, if you had that game behind closed doors... It, it would not have developed in the way it did no, at all. It no. couldn't Some teams would be suffocated by that. Mm. What's your moment of the year, Johnny Ward? Yeah, as I said, it's, it, it's like... Oh, it's Lowry. It's Lowry, but because I th it's not... A pers from, a, from a personal perspective, it isn't. Like, from a personal perspective... That's what I'm asking. I thought... Um, now I don't want you know. It's the time. This, this is okay. This this. Galway United. It's not the time your horse won. Like I mean, Galway United is... went two 0 up on Shelburne in the first no. match of the season and thought they were going to win it and they lost three two. But at that moment, that that few minutes, <laughs> we thought you were going to be shells. That was great. It was. Um, <laughs> this is this is an an extremely sad story because it's it's a, a jockey who's at the peak of his powers is diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And when Pat Smullen was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer last year, I don't think racing has ever been hit by anything like it. Um, even though we lost three jockeys in 2003, um, Pat Smullen being the recognisable name that he was um, and the Iron Man, to suddenly um, you know, be, be, be dealt this blow and then to want to come back and want to at least, you know, he didn't he didn't retire until ages later, despite the fact he got pancreatic cancer. And then he organises this charity race in Punchdown in which Pat is going to ride for the last time. And then shortly before that, he gets a second bout. And so, like, when that news came in, it seemed almost as bad as the first for racing and obviously for Pat. But it was, like, such a blow. Mm -hmm. But to turn that into the triumph of the fundraiser for pancreatic cancer and... Um, you know, when you look at Doddy Ware with motor neuron disease, what uh, uh, Bernard Jackman retweeted some tribute to Doddy Ware on Twitter the other day, and uh, you know, it's, it's hard not to get emotional because Doddy Ware is raising an, an awful lot of money such that we can find out what we can do with motor neuron disease, which is uncurable. But Pat Smullen, people were donating millions, like literally, Hand and Al Maktoum donated like I think a million or something like that. But that day to see Pat Smullen. And Tony McCoy in our and Pat Smolin's aged like so much since he's diagnosed. But to see the two of them in tears, like as a as a guy who doesn't like I don't I don't cry very often, but that day it was very, very hard not to be totally blown away by it. And that was another day where the crowd at the courage just everything was just like this wave of emotion. And it was like, as bad as this diagnosis is, there's hope because of Pat Smullen and how he's dealt with it. And that day was my highlight of the year because it wasn't about sport, it was about mortality and just that we're all going to pass away eventually, but if we can react to news as, as well as he has, uh, or half as well, we'll all be like better people. Well, that's a good answer. Some texts in. 
What about Sam Bennett? He had a great year too in cycling, says Dave. Lads, you cannot have a chat about 2019 without mentioning Liverpool 4, Barcelona 0. Cheers, Chris and Kevin. I'm going to come to the Liverpool City stuff in a minute. Do accountants sit around in December discussing the best profit and loss sheets they saw in 2019? <laughs> Or electricians write the best writing jobs they did over the last 12 months. Don't mind me, I'm just under pressure with the Christmas shopping, but enjoying the chat all the same lads from Declan. I don't think they do. I don't think they make very good radio. Could it be that the group surveyed in that Teneo sponsorship to, uh, uh, thingy just pick names that are very common in the sporting headlines and are easy to remember for non-sports fans his own? That almost certainly is a factor in this. Yeah, for sure. Uh, lads, my uh, sporting highlight of 2019 was Johnny Ward presenting off the ball and putting his rarely worn rugby hat on. He's Mr. Versatile, says Tara. I'm sure I must know who that person is. <laughs> Nobody would mean that. Lads, 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 the most memorable moment, sporting moment of the year. There is only one. Stop with the wishy-washy stories. Declan Rice finally declaring for <laughs> That was a big moment. That was a horrible says moment. Kev. <laughs> not, I? <laughs> um, I, I, in fairness, the Liverpool-Barcelona game was utterly insane. I mean, the moment where Trent Alexander-Arnold takes that corner. That corner. Ingenuity and... If you, if you pause that for a second, like your moment of wonder, so the goal happens, the camera shakes, and then you see the replay and you fully understand what's happened. And then somewhere between that replay and you're watching the next replay and it's sinking in, the magnitude, the mm. brilliance, that Alexander-Arnold. That is when you're just living life. You're not thinking about work the next day, you're not doing anything else. That is just sport absolutely uh, grabbing you by the throat. Ecstasy if you're a Liverpool fan, kind of a, even if you're not a Liverpool fan, there was just a sense of, oh my God, and, this is And amazing. to do it, but, but all, like, the, all this stuff about Anfield being the special European nights, like, I, I was at the Napoli game in the group where they, they needed to win and they scraped through with a 1-0 win. And, like, if you go to Liverpool games, it's almost like being at an Ireland game. There's so many Irish people there and so many non-English people. So it, it's, it, it can be a bit strange, the atmosphere at times, but nights like that, Anf Anfield is absolutely rocking. Yeah. And I think Barcelona didn't know what hit them. I think they were absolutely hit, hitting, the, hitting the chest by a cannonball, partly by the crowd and partly of the madness of Klopp just saying, let's give this a go. Did you see the video in the dressing room recently? No. Of the Barcelona dressing room. It's on but they built it up too much, didn't they? They, they it's kind on of Twitter, talked about Anfield and talked about Anfield. Pep does it all the time as well. They kept yeah. building it up and building it up and building it up, even though they're like, they should be well able to go out and closing that out. I would thought so. I don't know what happened. It doesn't actually make much sense. No. Dava Cari like Diva Carigi playing up front. And he was brilliant. Yeah, he, like, I think actually he's an underrated player, but yeah. that should never have happened. I mean, <laughs> no. But it was. That was as as a, as a, as an actual football moment. That has to be the highlight. I think. I think so. Can I just throw one add on to that? So the Liverpool City thing has been such a feature of our lives over the last eighteen months, and this year it's been unbelievable. The City Liverpool game in January, mm. the two one win for City, this is the best game of football I've seen in a very long time. Like the four 0 Danfield is hard to compete with for sheer excitement, but just in terms of the quality, the two best teams in the world, the stakes, the fitness on show, the pressure they were putting each other under and still the refusal to go along with the ball. Like you literally had Trent Alexander-Arnold as last man back under pressure, scooping it over Aguero's head, running around him. It was mad stuff. But the, I remember sitting there about an hour in and just thinking, this is the future. This is just football from a different level. It's brilliant. This is like the Premier League is streets ahead of everything. So I'm throwing that in as like a moment which encapsulates the Liverpool City thing. Because every other week the was just them winning. Well, it was also the game that decided the league. If I well, that was the stakes. Companies yeah. goals, another one, if you're talking about big Premier League moments. Yeah. That, that rasper. I think the Liverpool-Barcelona thing is slightly... The Liverpool fans want Here like we this. go. Here we go. It's slightly undermined by the final being so crap. Yeah. Mm. I mean, that was just a rubbish final. I mean, it was a ter it was, I mean, sure, Liverpool fans won't care, but it was a pretty poor way of winning it. Like, you know, you kind of... After all the expectation, the build-up. Yeah, and that, I think the two-week gap between the... The, the game and the last game in the league and, and the Premier and the Champions League final just undermines everything. You know, they all went on holidays to Spain and then came mm. back and played this game. It kind of, yeah, it took I took it took took away from obviously it's not, it doesn't take away from that game to a degree, but yeah. I think it slightly took away from the achievement. It was such an electric Champions League as well, leading up to that final because the Spurs game as well. Like well, United against PSG with the last minute penalty, and then in the semi-finals the day after the Liverpool Barcelona game. That's the only mention Ali Gunnar Solskjaer is going to get in this yeah. whole. One and only, the only year. highlight of the PSG, year. PSG, yeah. Um, the Ajax story as oh. well. Do you know, like that's, I can, t t what they did and Spurs get to, as, as far as they did, it was kind of like, there were a lot of things that you wouldn't expect to happen. One of the most baffling decisions of 2019. So Lucas Moura scores a hat-trick to oh, get yeah. Spurs to the final and has dropped for a 40% fit Harry Kane yeah. in the final and Backfired. people wonder why that didn't work. Yeah, got to take a break. There's loads more to get to. Still nil all in El Clasico, we have Johnny and Rory and Ronan going through the moments of the year. Well, I'm not sure exactly what this is. We're not going to get to everything, so I don't know what to call this. We're just chewing the fat. GAA, we have a lot here.
We have five in a row. Johnny Cooper sent off the Kerry match. We have Kilkenny Tipperary, the Richie Hogan red card. We have Kilkenny just getting to a final, beating Limerick, Brian Cody's finest hour. We have Dublin doing the three in a row, beating Galway in one of the worst, most dour matches you'll ever see, but doing the three in a row. We have Neve Kilkenny and Galway storming past Kilkenny to win the Camogie All-Ireland, and I'm sure a lot more GAA besides. GAA moment of the year? Personally, I think uh, it was Dublin's eight minutes or nine minutes after halftime in this May on the All Ireland semi final. Um, I, I didn't even mention that. You shouldn't watch an All Ireland final in a hotel room at 4 a.m. And that's where I watched the All Ireland final replay. Yeah. And while I was getting very emotional messages from family members who had been there all the, you know, all, all the way, um, it's just not a play, time and a place to really enjoy a piece of sporting history. So that's where I watched the replay. I, I, I knew at the moment the. The final whistle went to the, at the drawn game. I wouldn't make it back. I was going to be in Japan for the replay. But to be there and to see that team, that, that brilliant team, go through the, the, the gear so quickly against their, their previously bigger biggest rivals, and Kerry will obviously be their biggest rivals from now on, yeah. was just an incredible piece of sporting theatre. It was. Um, and then to see them play the way they did with 14 men was, was pretty impressive as well. Um, it underlined their credentials and just their brilliance. And it was a night, I think it was a good way to win a five in a row. If you're going to win a five in a row, last year's All-Ireland was such a kind of, the final was such a non-event really against Tyrone, whereas this year they were properly tested along the way and, and they had to rise above it. I'd forgotten that 10, 12 minutes after halftime against Mayo. I was at the game, my dad a Mayo man beside me, and I've never felt the air go out of a stadium so much. I watched that game, with the, went, to, with the, went to the game with Nathan Murphy and yeah. uh, spoke to a few Mayo people at half time. They were like, everyone was getting the pints in. It was like, Mayo this, were brilliant this in the first happen. half. Yeah. And that was like, um, if you had this, you had like a revolt against like a really powerful army and the army just quashed it like quashed, that. Yeah. It was like that. It was eight minutes of utter, utter brilliance. There wasn't, and Mayo time, there wasn't time to breathe. No. But, you know, in the stadium, I've never felt a, a stadium, well, okay, half of it were losing their mind, but the other half almost mm. couldn't breathe. And I remember saying, someone needs to go down injured. Someone needs to go down injured. Why yeah. is no one going down injured? Why are three of them not going down injured? I think they were just like, couldn't breathe themselves. Yeah, it was just, um, they, they, they couldn't deal with it. I don't think any team could have dealt with Dublin. And we, we do divorce, um, we, we can't really see greatness at times because, like as Rory was saying, we don't want everyone to win all the time. So we don't, like people, everyone wants Dublin to lose in All-Ireland sooner or later unless you're from Dublin because it, it does get a little bit tedious with the same team winning all the time. But we should remember just how bloody good they are, how consistent they are to lose one championship game in, what, seven years. Yeah. And that, that the, what Rory mentions, that, that would probably be my, yeah, that would probably be my Gaelic Games memory of the year, that just utter suppression of a revolt like that, bang, bang, you've had your fun, it's, it's over now. I was happy to see them do the five in a row. I was happy mm. to see history. And they're a likeable team. They're very likeable guys um, and they seem very humble. And um, But that, that, that was amazing. Like that, and just to do it against Mayo, to, the hope is the thing that kills you. Yeah. you know? and my moment of the year on the hurling with Richie Hogan is, OK, the red card happened. The game was ruined. Fast forward 24 hours. Ronan Mullen gets his phone out. It's five, half five. We have an empty show. This is a common occurrence. The stress is on. Everyone's getting ratty. In a, in a, in a just a, kind of a, a, a strain of desperation, Ronan says, as we're gathered in that next room at about half five, I could text Richie Hogan. And there was almost a, um. ah, that's just, like, you're not helping. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there was a, you're not helping. Come up with a good idea that actually is going to happen. Fine, text him. And then we kept talking. And I would say within two minutes, the response came back saying, what time? Well, initially, he, he was kind of not crazy about doing it, and I had to kind of coax him a little bit. Oh, but did you? It was kind of strange that, because he's such an affable guy and we've dealt with him over the years, that, that he found himself in the middle of this storm. Yeah. And uh, But it just it speaks to what a stand-up guy he is, that he was willing to take the call and own the story in a way that most people wouldn't have the bravery to do it, really. But said he didn't, he didn't raise the elbow. And I had to say as politely as I could, it really doesn't look that way. But if that's his truth, Joe, he has to own his <laughs> truth. And, you know, he it can't, get, it can't get inside his own, his own head necessarily. It sort of ruined the game, with Different televisions down in Kilkenny, because yeah. I think everyone in Kilkenny, every, <laughs> certainly every TV pundit. Henry Shefflin. Henry Shefflin. Tommy Welch on yeah, here the next day. Everyone in them, they all, they all rallied around. I just hope we see him back, actually. My other memory from that phone call was how crocked he is and how much he's been fighting. He can't go out and go to a pitch on his own and strike a few balls without a physio there to help him do it mm. beforehand. That's how he's trying to be the best Richie and Hogan he could be. R Richie Hogan was nowhere near the player he was the last few years because of the injuries he had, and what a hurler. Oh, um, incredible. But the, I, like, I, remember, I remember that quite well because um, I, I was very annoyed with 
I think particularly Henry Shefflin for for having the temerity to suggest that, that was not a red card. Kieran Whelan said the same by Johnny Cooper. Yeah, like, and he was right. And <laughs> <laughs> but like, do you think there's a point whereby in All Ireland finals in particular? you shouldn't actually have players on from those respective counties. I understand in round one of them, like so early on in the championship, if you have like, uh, name a county, a Leitrim, the general pundit's not gonna know much about Leitrim, so getting a former player on who has an insight makes total sense. That, I understand that. But when you get to our final territory, everybody knows the Dublin team, everybody knows the Kilkenny team, mm -hmm. and actually we get, we get overly biased I think it, opinion. It, there's no problem with having them on, but if they, if they do what they do, like if they do that, then don't have them on again. You know, you have, it's your discretion who you have on, and if someone blatantly just... Joe Broly took the hit. Yeah, Joe Broly, a martyr, yeah. martyr for the cause. Well, I, I, I thought Joe was, was very wrong with what he said in the final, but just in defence of Richie Hogan, so I, I think I was here that evening, and you said we've Richie Hogan on, and I was like, wow, that's an incredible coup. Um, but this is going to be a tricky interview, because if you're coming from my perspective, Richie's sort of let his team down here, and he's, he was out of order with the tackle, but I listened to the interview, yeah. and the problem is we all watched that tackle in slow motion. It didn't happen in slow motion. It happened like that. Mm. So Richie Hogan is in front of 80,000 people. The narrative is Richie Hogan is trying to get payback for what happened earlier on, but Richie Hogan put forward his point of view, and, and very honestly, and I came back from that interview and I was like, I do need to reassess how what happened here because in fairness to Richie, he's Richie's given us his version of events and it happened in a split second. Yeah. Maybe maybe like the maybe the head went into the tackle a bit. So it it, it was a very valuable interview in that like <laughs> I was convinced, Richie. I was convinced this is a straight red card. But I was yeah. like, maybe, maybe what Richie yeah, says. Don't for flip flopping, Johnny. But may, no, because like this is Rory McIlroy. Yes, but maybe this. But the, God, bloody hell, it was a shit final after Terrible. that. Terrible, ruined it. Tipperary don't get enough credit because they blitzed them. They would have done it anyway, in my opinion. And I was yeah. at the semi final, which is one of the great weekends now in Irish sport, where the two semi finals were the same weekend. Which was first, Wexford or the Kilkenny Limerick? Kenny was on the Saturday. Okay. And I was at Wexford against Tip on the Sunday and Wexford, like they're just a special breed. Like yeah. the, the Wexford GA fans are incredible. And they had that game in their hands. They Tip didn't know how to get over Tip the line. Tipperary got a man sent off and look mm. at the difference in how the two teams dealt with it. The, the, that Wexford was... changed their entire system and Tipperary just I, I genuinely believe Wexford had every chance of beating Kilkenny if they got through. Like Tipperary, are, till, there's no way Kilkenny should have been on All-Ireland final this year. There are probably four or five teams better than them. Brian Cody's finest achievements said several people. It was, like, it was incredible. Like, for, to talk to Limerick fans the day of the finals, think like, maybe we're a bit arrogant about Galway and Limerick the last years, but like, how in the hell are Limerick or Kilkenny here and we're not? Yeah. But I was talking to a Wexford fan last Friday and he's just like, oh man, if we just got over the line against Tip. But Tip deserve huge credit for as much as Wexford mentally didn't know how to get the job done. Tip were in a bad position. They had five points down and, kept, and ran they, away with it. Kept giving end. away crazy goals, Tipperary, mm. when they were on top. So it felt like it was going to be Wexford's day and Tipperary wouldn't be denied. But that Leinster Championship in Hurling was amazing. Every, yes. every bit of it. Munster, Trump, ended, Munster, Munster was better last year, but yeah. this year Leinster but was phenomenal. It's an advertisement for football about the benefits of change. We're not having a championship. No, no, absolutely. But the, yeah, for, for Galway to be knocked out on the pitch as Dublin celebrated yeah. because of the draw down the road, and then Dublin to go out and get knocked out by Leash, was it a week later? That, 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 was like, that, was, that was one of the freakiest days ever, like going to you know, um, Parnell Park and thinking, is, this actually could happen yeah. because it could well be a draw in the other game and, uh, you know, Galway, were, Joe Canning wasn't starting. Yeah. We're in Parnell Parks, a hard place to win. But the, the Galway game ended early and um, Richie, the aforementioned Richie, um, Henry Shefflin was on duty, I think, for RTE. So all these people who were in the stands turned around with their backs to the pitch looking at uh, Henry Shefflin with the cans on as he sort of, with his face, described what was going on in the last minute. And when he went like this, like he, he did something like this at the end and everyone knew it was a draw, there were these Gawley fans around me and they're just like, this is June and yeah. we're out of the championship. Yeah. And it just, I, could, I couldn't believe it. It was and just it, absolutely sad. It was incredible. And there were shots of Davey and Brian Cody at full time gone. Story, are we okay? Are we okay? I think we're okay. But After all the hard egg in Crow Park to see Mayo win a national title, not Sam I know was magic John and Mayo. Remember the green and red of Mayo in Crow no. Park when they won the league? No. Oh, that was a great moment. The green and red of Mayo in Crow Park. Kevin Kilban coming in the next day forcing us to play that at the top of the show because mm. he was so confident that they'd turn things around. But Oh, I thought no, there was such hope. James Horn, this is what he can do. Somebody says, lads, come on. Relentless Mayo apologies coming <laughs> in. I mean, it's only the league. Like. Round three of Louise against Joshua. Jaw dropping, says Philip, who's driving home for Xmas. Xmas, good man, Philip. The Louise Joshua fight's worth a quick mention. It was phenomenal. The first one, obviously. The second one was 
atrocious. Again, and I think I, I said it to you earlier on, so Katie Taylor's just had this really contentious victory yeah. in on the undercard. But deserved. Yeah, deserved. <laughs> and I'm, I'm just typing away trying to get that done. And that's enough. I was thinking, this is really good. I'll see Katie Taylor make history. Anthony Joshua has a nice, easy fight. Yeah. Madison Square Garden, it's all good. It turned out to be the most dramatic boxing night of maybe the last decade. Yeah. So, yeah, it was just crazy. Joshua knocks him down, you think, for all the world. It's curtains and then... It just flips on its head, and the division flips on its head. Malachy Kirkin in the Irish Times did a look back at the 20, or maybe it was more, sorry, excuse me, but he did a host of the top female sports moments of the year, and one which caught my eye, Johnny, because I knew you were coming in, I wanted to ask you about Rachel Blackmore. So Malachy made the point in his piece that before 1819, the highest number of winners ever by a female jumps jockey in a season was 39, that was Nina Carberry. Blackmore has blitzed that last season, ending up with 90. She came second in the Irish Jockeys Championship to Paul Townend. But he also adds, for context, the other jockeys who've hit 90 winners in the season this decade are Ruby Walsh, Davy Russell, Brian Cooper, that is it. And he makes the point, it's not just that no woman has ever been at this level before, very few jockeys of either gender have. So Rachel Blackmore this year. Yeah, uh, so recently in France they introduced um, an allowance for female jockeys to encourage female jockeys. Um, I was dead against it. Now I can see the argument for it. So an allowance is like the horse will, will have five pounds less weight on its back if, if there's a female jockey. For me, that's discrimination and that's sexism. It's kind of saying to, saying to the girls, you're not good enough, so we're going to give you a hand. Um, now, there's an argument for it, but that's by the by. Um, there's unquestionably sexism in sport. Um, you know, speaking about a jockey recently who's doing really well, still I get a lot of texts back like, God, she's really hot, she's really good looking. It's not about her talent, it's like what she looks like. And that still goes on. It still goes on for female sports presenters, it goes on for female sports people. It's like, if she's a very good soccer player, that's one thing, but oh, she's, she's really pleasing on the eye, isn't she? And we need to get away from that nonsense and acknowledge how good these people are as, as, as sports people. So Rachel Blackmore to do what she's did without any allowance. But it's not only the fact that she's a female rider. Rachel's Black, Rachel Blackmore's career was going nowhere. She was an, she was an amateur um, riding the odd horse and bumpers. And when she did turn pro, I would say 99% of people thought she was absolutely nuts. Like, you're getting nowhere as an amateur, so you're going to turn pro. But she decided to start riding um, in, in professional races, and all of a sudden she's riding for uh, Henry de Bromhead, she's riding for Michael O'Leary. And Michael O'Leary has put huge faith in female riders. Um, so, so Katie... On, Katie um, uh, Rachel O'Neill, sorry, um, would, be the, would be the main one. Um, but 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 Prince before Rachel Blackmore came along, and for her to push so, as hard as she did, and she's quite shy as an individual, so the the attention didn't come naturally to her. She was just happy being in the saddle. And there's a great story emerging now where she's riding Honeysuckle, who's a mayor and who is one of the most promising mayors I think I've ever seen, and could could genuinely become another Dawn Run. She could certainly, if she could win a Gold Cup, I think she could win a Champion Hurdle. And Rachel has the ride on her, and it's just this great story of girl power. But Rachel, uh, I. I think has done absolutely wonders for women in racing because racing is the only sport where females that I can think of anyway where females and males compete. Darts. Darts, yeah. But against each other. Darts. Last Did you not see this week? Come on. At, at, at a level playing field? In the World Championships. We just saw it last night. First female to be in a, a Did you miss this last night? Alan Sherrick. Okay, I, I wasn't watching the darts last night. But Rachel for, Blackmore. First time a female darts player at the PDC has beaten a male. No, right, that, that's amazing. So, the, 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 I mean, darts, okay. Well, oh, here we go, go on. Oh. Darts, no, no, is grand. darts is grand, and it is a sport, fair enough, and I wouldn't be able to throw the darts like they do. This but, is humans. But, but this is riding horses at, like, 40 miles an hour, riding against Ruby Walsh, riding against Tony McCoy. So the horse uh, does all the work. And the horse does a lot of the work, but <laughs> Rachel Blackmore developed into an incredibly good jockey, and... Um, I think she's, she has become an absolute icon for, for women in sport because she's done it in a quietly efficient way, mm. no fanfare about it, and uh, she's, she's an absolutely, I, 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 it's absolutely amazing what she's done. And if she did have a five pounds allowance like they have in France, I think it would be tainted. Okay. So that's worthy of mention. Mick McCarthy, Rory. Stephen Kenny, Rory. Stephen Kenny, yeah. Mick McCarthy gets a... Yeah, well, the, it's just, I mean, the whole Irish football scene gets, gets that, and I, the McCarthy appointment is just was so vanilla and so unambitious. And yet vanilla? The, yeah. I was looking for Nila Hagendas before he came on the show. I do quite like it. Yeah, it's, just, it's a phrase. Vanilla is one of the most beautiful. <laughs> what? Mick McCarthy? Sorry, Johnny. Vanilla. Mick McCarthy, I, I just thought it was such an uninspiring appointment. Was it, it not was a, a, an understandable, it was steady a, the ship It was a lifetime achievement. 
you know, you, you've always wanted to come back and say, why don't we have you back? But and I was, was it, was it more, this, the FAI would have known they were broke at that stage. Maybe it was a steady the ship, we need to get to the Euros appointment. I, I, I wouldn't and jump to that conclusions going? there, Joe. Huh? And how's that going? I mean, if you'd offered us two games at the start of the oh, campaign... Would you, would you have bit me? <laughs> 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 I, look, I... I I just to correct it, the FBI wouldn't have known they were broke. They must a have very, been very select number of people, I would say. The same people who might have been making the appointment. The FBI is a lot of people. Most of the people the FBI at the known. time. But was I mean, the people person. making the appointment of Mick McCarthy no, would, have, I, would have had a sense I, of things. I, I, I honestly wouldn't jump the gun on that. Well, anyway. Uh, I, I think um, John Delaney would have been involved in the hiring of Mick McCarthy very closely. And I think John Delaney would have had a very good feel for the FAI finances, <laughs> as the sports direct deal might suggest. Uh, Mick McCarthy's done a Mick McCarthy job, hasn't he? I mean, he's, it, it, it's been game, there's been a lot of one-all one draws, it's been fine, it's been uninspiring, the football hasn't been great, there's been moments, the players are the players, and he's getting, the, like, the players are championship players, and he's getting championship performance out of them. I think Kenny is actually, even though this is the most contrived setup we'll ever see, he may have just timed it right to avoid this campaign. I know it's a World Cup campaign, it's harder to qualify. Yeah. But he's now got his hands on the best generation of players we've produced in so long. And he gets to bring them through when they're ready. Because they're clearly not quite ready. I mean, Troy Parrott, for all the hype and, and the talk, he's not ready yet. If he was, he'd be playing uh, you know, first-team football. Same with, like, I know Connolly's getting games, he's not scoring regularly. But by the time Kenny gets his hands gets through, he knows he's very so well. They know what he wants to do. It may just be you know, John Delaney's greatest gift to Irish football. Yeah, because what was initially what felt like an instance of pandering, trying to please everybody, yeah. when Mick McCarthy was very clearly their preferred candidate and everyone was up in arms, they said, we'll slot Stephen Kenny in, play it long term. What if Mick McCarthy wins the Euros, was what everyone was asking. So that we don't have to worry about that, I don't think. What if he gets to the semis? Yeah, it's mad stuff. So yeah. now it was, it was we a know genuine worry for us all. And as Rory says, like, uh, Stephen Kenny, like, if there's a ray of light in this Irish football world, it's the under-21s who've been yeah. unbelievable to watch. Yeah. Sweden there's, performances. There's no, there's no, yeah. th this isn't ray of light stuff at all. This, like, on the pitch, um, I, I've never been as, as enthusiastic about what the future holds for Irish football on the pitch. Yeah. It's just... It, but in the what, context of... What's yeah, going on. so that's the, so as you said, the ray of light. But like, it's strange that we're we, we can't even talk about it on the pitch. Like the Kenny thing, John John Delaney. This was a fine achievement on John Delaney's part. I don't know how it happened. I don't know why it happened, but totally re Rory. The fact that Kenny can bring up bring these under twenty ones, educate them, mm. and we went to Sweden um, to the second team, second seed in the group, and we absolutely battered them, battered them, and we were one nil down. Th then we missed the penalty and had a goal disallowed and absolutely battered them in Sweden, 1-3-1. Yeah. Sweden then came over to Dublin with, yeah. with this point to prove, and they're like, these, basically these inferior team to us, we're not going to be beaten again by these. They're 1-0 one, one in the first, they're one nil up in the first half in Tala. Ireland were a little bit rattled. And it's sorry to interrupt, it's an Irish team with lots of changes from the lots Swedish of changes. team. And, and Connolly's gone. Kenny, for, Kenny doesn't guys. talk about the players that he doesn't have. He extols the positives of the players he has. Kenny laid into them at half time and he said, we need better. Uh, apparently a couple of players in particular He's like, you need to up your game here, but I trust in you. And in the second half, they absolutely steamrolled Sweden. And Ireland went out onto the pitch against Tala. And I, I spoke to Conor Rowan about this. Ireland went onto the, the pitch in Tala against Italy, genuinely believing they were favourites to win that game. They should have won the game. They got a nil-all draw. And Kenny is not telling them what they can't do, but what they can do. Yeah. And a succession of Irish managers could have actually learned from that. Lads, our rowers, Paula Donovan, best lightweight men's rower in the world the last four years in a row, Sunita Puspor, a.k.a. Dominant Puspor, best female rower in the world and world champion the last two years. What other Irish sports person is the best in the world? And we have two of them in rowing, says Peter in Dublin. Somebody says, lads, how can you ignore Lewis Hamilton's record-breaking run at the moment? As a neutral fan, my most memorable moment was driving to Cork during the first game, trying to roar Kerry to victory in the second half from Tom. On the Hamilton point, we're just not going to get to everything anyway. I do want to mention, I had a moment when the hockey team won the penalty shootout and it was on RT television. The miserable weather those two nights, do you remember? And it was on RT TV, but like it was a full house and they had relayed the pitch in Donnybrook and they've reached the Olympics. So the first time since I think women's hockey was at the Olympics since 1980 that the Irish team has made their way there and there was the Roshan Upton broken arm to score the penalty and all that kind of stuff was going on. But that was a moment where I really thought to myself, man, you look at where they've come in the space of a year so nobody known about much about this team. Virtually no funding. Shane Ross pulls that stunt after the World Cup. Much to their complete surprise, they weren't told anything about that. Ross just pops in and says, and funding of one and a half million. That was all they heard. And they were like, <gasps> and then it turns out there's a ton of other detail in it. So all that's gone on. But I remember sitting at home watching the Full House, 6,000 tickets sold. And they weren't like giveaway tickets either. Like people had paid decent money for these tickets. And it's on TV. And I do remember thinking, 
geez, this is like the 20 by 20 thing, mm. really proving the point that if you don't give it publicity in the first place, the sport can't hope to grow. That was a moment, I mean, not that I was particularly skeptical about the um, plan before that, but that was a moment where I thought, geez, like this is a little glimpse of the future. And we've seen the Irish football team, the women's football team getting decent attendances as well. There was a cock up with the one at Tallaght Stadium where they gave away tickets for free and then people just didn't yeah. show up. So they'll have to rectify that. But good atmospheres on TV. I thought it was actually a really big moment this year because We've seen the All-Ireland football final in particular and the Camogie final being on TV and decent attendances. But now that like sports like hockey and the Irish women's football team were getting fans and attending the, the, and on TV, I thought, oh, this is actually really moving. This is a, The next four or five years... Women's sport gonna, is going to absolutely it's gonna explode. explode. It no really is. That. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. the Women's World Cup was, that was this year, wasn't it? That, yeah. was like, you know, that was a proper world event and it yeah. got proper coverage. As, yeah. as a, you know, in fact, it was on the BBC. It does help when things are on totally. free to air TV. I mean, I watched a lot of that Women's World Cup. I, just, I happened to be off at the time and I got to watch probably more of that than I did a lot of domestic football well, over, over the last year. How many the, even the women's rugby team who are struggling at the moment and are, are may well, not they, make the they, next World Cup. They've been abandoned if you listen to what they're saying. Yeah, but they get good crowds. I mean, they, they get good crowds in Donnybrook and, and it's grown and even though they've been struggling, they still, there's still a bit of name recognition there with, with some of their players, you know, and, and Leinster are playing Harlequins in a game this weekend which is possibly a stepping stone to them maybe becoming part of the of a more professional thing in the future. Yeah. It is, it's going to take time. I think until there's domestic... I mean, it's all well and good getting your all the finals or your your Olympic qualifier, but until Pegasus versus Hermes or you know those clubs can attract crowds on a on a weekly sure. basis and make it sustainable, or if they can become part of some sort of European league, or if, you know if you can get a, a professional thing up and running, it's going to still be one-off events. But it's definitely grow there's definitely growth there, and no, I mean you can sound patronising when you talk about this. Totally, stuff, but, but it was a glimpse of the future. I thought that that was doing so well, and do you know what's particularly interesting? That the ter terrestrial TV rights for those events is at a stage now where it's not, I presume, anything com in comparison comparison to the men's. So we've talked about Lowry and Taylor being like the most memorable moments for a lot of people of the year. I'd love to know how many people watch them because they're behind a paywall ultimately. And you know, the Masters is now not on terrestrial TV at all from next year. Mm. Every golfer who grows up says they grew up watching the Masters, the British Opens and Sky Sports. Like these bigger sports behind the paywall are shooting themselves in the foot. That opens the gap up further in the market, I think, for women's sports to swoop in and grab easy eyeballs, like you're saying about the Women's Football World Cup. Yeah, yeah well, there like, And businesses really want to get associated with women's sport now, and that's... But if you can imagine women for years and years going to the male games and um, sitting beside men who have no interest in women's sport, it's no wonder that it's emboldening them that this is our sport, we're going to grow it. But our, our challenge in this country is to stop young girls from... stop from... to prevent them from pulling out of sport at a very early age because there are still a lot of girls who don't continue into like and the, the, the joys that sport brings but also for their physical betterment we need to keep the to keep the momentum up because there's still like a, a cut-off point where a lot of girls and their teens just stop playing sport and they don't go sure. back and I think we need to uh, look at that. Still one of the moments we will all remember the real really near the moment for years to come will be John Delaney at the Oireachtas. That was that was just the most spectacular. I mean, do you remember the build-up? Oh my God, they're going to appear, and it kept ticking and ticking. They're going to appear, and then we waited for his opener, and he read out his opener, and then he said, "My, um, I've been legally advised not to answer any questions pertaining to the loan, or actually my 14 years as CEO, but anything else you want to ask me?" I, that I, was did, I, I was here. I did a pay-per-view the day the Sunday Times story broke. The morning after the injunction failed, yeah. and, and um, we were so careful around it. We were so, we, oh, like, you know, yeah. I think Neil just gave a kind of an overview and we moved on pretty well, much my, straight away because we weren't sure how yeah, to deal yeah. with it and we didn't even, I kind of regret, we didn't even say, look, this is a very unusual situation. We just kind of went, right, it's the FAI, they're, like, they're so litigious. You just didn't want to say anything, put a foot wrong. It was the morning after Ireland had been ho hockey by Wales. Yeah. We kind of moved on to the rugby. Yeah. I feel like I could have made a, could have really made a moment. Made a moment. Yeah. My yeah. low light of 2019 is ringing solicitors on Sunday mornings for the Sunday paper review yeah. far too often and freaking out. Do you know what's mad about that 100 grand loan? So I remember we were talking behind the scenes and kind of going, like, what, what's going on here? Like yeah. what actually, what, what has, it's hard to figure out what's gone on. And actually it didn't even occur to us, the most, sometimes the most simple explanation, i.e. they're broke, yeah. didn't actually occur to me. I thought, that, well, they only need 100 grand. What kind of creative accounting's happened here and why? But actually, it was just they were broke. Well, that, that was that was the day though when Irish football changed forever. And I think he was his mask slipped off because he for 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 the other FAI officials to have to answer the questions that he probably yes. should have. I thought it was like 
these people have families as well, and those people like Conway, obviously, like they, they, they have questions to answer ultimately, but they were put in a situation that day where I, I came away from that day thinking he cannot survive now because his, yes, his acolytes and his, 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 his allies or whatever in the FEI, but I will say one thing for the media, the journalists who were there that day, thankfully there was a half-time break as such in the Rocks Committee, That's right. and some of the politicians said to you know the journalists, many of whom will be friends of ours, they were like, how, how, are, we how are we getting on? And they were like, very, very bad. Yeah. You need to ask this, 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 and the second half, everything changed, That's and right. football would never be the same again. Yeah, um, and actually, because you remember, sorry, I'd come in on this, Roy, but I was saying, to follow on your point, that up until that Oireachtas stay where he refused to answer any questions, there was a quotient of people, I think Eamon Dunphy said it in Marion Finucane's show when it first broke, for instance, saying, well, look, what's so bad? A CEO gave a dig out, maybe this is okay, but I think everybody, when he refused to answer questions, and allowed all the other people around him to take the heat, thought, your time here is done. And the performance of Jonathan O'Brien of Sinn Féin, when, how many bank accounts have you lads? And the oh, old guy saying one, Murray, Hang on, yeah. just, can we get back to you there in 25? And Jonathan O'Brien today again was, was off the charts in terms of grilling. And his, and his stuff today was like, it's great theatre and as a journalist I love reading about it and I've really enjoyed the, the work that a lot of journalists have done on it to, to, to dig and to dig and to bring it out and I really admire that. But some of my greatest, best sporting moments of the year came in the League of Ireland, just from a personal point of view. Being there with my family, supporting the team that it's I love. all about the Some League unbelievable, Ireland, uh, unbelievable moments, the, the moments that I'll probably remember longer than, than, than any others. And we don't know when, like, we don't know what the fixtures are going to be next year. We might, might not even have a league. And that's what the real, obviously there's the people in, in Abbottstown who have a job. And like, the theatre is amazing, but God, the, the like, the, even the fact that Shane Ross hadn't even considered the League of Ireland today just spoke volumes for the way that that community is considered within our sport and our society. And it's very, very, very frustrating because we can think, see the potential. Do you think that's a class thing? Partly. Partly, but I think it's... But Gaelic Games isn't. Like, Gaelic Games is a fairly working class pursuit as well. But it's got its own house in order. I'm talking about the government response. Yeah, but... The, and the Gaelic, Gaelic Games is just so popular that government didn't need to worry mm. um, in the same way. Like, uh, sorry, so popular that actually government were forced to play ball because basically every parish in the country had GEA, so politics had to pay attention, whereas football... I think we've always been held up in comparison to England, and even though it's a completely unfair comparison, I think possibly ever since the United came over and hammered Shamrock Rovers in the, was that the 50s, and, and, and kind of the, the myth of the League of Ireland was exposed, that we were so far off, the, the way the English club game was going, and all of our best players then go over and play there, all the money's there, all the attractions there, it's so easy to get to, and ba I think the League of Ireland has had to reinvent itself as this this other thing, this kind of niche, niche. produce. It's almost like an underground um, thing. It is, yeah, like yeah. it is. And, and those of us who love it we're not, we're not can't cool understand why everyone doesn't love it. Mm. But um, I've come to the conclusion that it, that's what it will always be, but it could still be a successful niche See, thing if it just got a bit of support from someone who cared about it. Yeah. And it was quite clear that the governing body and today that the government don't give a damn about it. Mm. Um, the other sporting highlight was when Johnny Tip Rovers win the league after. Well, after listen, now that we can't finish on a higher note than that. <laughs> Johnny Ward, you're staying on for the football show where we'll oh, be talking no. some FAI. Rory O'Connor of the Irish Independent, thank you. And Cheers. Ronan Mullen, thank you as well.